Okay, let's get let's get started. So thanks, thank you all for taking some time out of your Thursday to listen about what we've been up to with Lacutus. My name is Ian Clark. I'm perhaps best known as the creator of Freenet, which was the first distributed decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. We launched our first version in March 2000. I designed Freenet several years before that as an undergrad project while I was studying computer science and artificial intelligence. And Freenet really pioneered a number of ideas. So a small world routing, distributed hash table, and cryptographic contracts. I think we were perhaps not the first first to conceive of them, but I think certainly the first to deploy software that actually use cryptographic contracts. And of course, that idea later became the basis for blockchain and, and that whole world of things. I don't claim that it kind of stemmed directly from, from our work, but we were certainly part of that whole kind of idea space and kind of techno utopian environment. And in fact, Hal Finney, who I think he either sent or received the very first Bitcoin transaction. I can't remember which, but Hal was very involved in Freenet back back in the early 2000s. And so there's it's definitely likely there was, there was some cross-pollination there. So I started to think about a successor to Freenet probably about 10 years ago, back, back in 2011. Freenet, Freenet was really always more of a kind of a research project, and it was very much designed for the internet as, ex as it existed 20 years ago. And we really thought of the internet at that time almost like a library where you kind of check information, you can check books in and you can check books out. So Freenet very much had this kind of data store design that wasn't able to do things like facilitate real-time communication and, and a bunch of other things that, bear in mind, this is before social media existed. So it's been clear to me for a while that the kind of idea would benefit from a fresh look. And as I said, started thinking about 10 years ago, came up with a design, worked on it for a year or two, decided it wasn't right, came up with a different design, went through that cycle a couple of times and came up with the design that eventually became Lacutus about two years ago. And that's what I'm going to talk about, talk about here. So first, as just in the chat before the thing, a couple of people noted that they weren't actually born when we released the first version of Freenet, which of course makes me feel very old. So thanks for that. But I thought it would be beneficial just to have a kind of common context to start with a little bit of. So back in the late 1960s, the US Department of Defense wanted to build a computer network that among other things, would be capable of surviving a nuclear attack. So they designed ARPANET, which of course was the predecessor to the internet, and they designed it in a way that was largely decentralized and highly fault tolerant. The idea being that if any node in the network was destroyed or damaged, that the network could adaptively route around it. And that was where the, that was the origin, perhaps not the origin, but, but that was certainly one of the early uses of packet switching as a technology, which of course is the basis for the internet protocol and the internet itself. So what, what happened after that? Well, I, I really view the modern internet as starting around probably 1994, which coincidentally is, is around where when I was first exposed to it. And this was when web browsers were first popularized, Mosaic, Netscape, and the, the World Wide Web really became kind of the killer app of the internet. Certainly there was there was also email, which was perhaps the, the second most popular use case. And other, other things like Usenet, which now is, is pretty obscure, but Usenet was interesting in that it was actually decentralized, pretty much truly decentralized. But, but really starting in 1994, the web took over and the web was very much a client server architecture. So you would have a large number of clients that were relatively dumb. These, these were the web browsers and they would all talk to a powerful server that would be sitting in a, in a data center somewhere. And that, that's really just the architecture. That's the architecture of the web. And 
why why was this popularized well it was much easier to build things that way we really understood client server architecture it's much easier to manage because you've got your servers sitting right there in your data center you can turn them on and off you can upgrade them and it's also much easier to monetize centralized services it's much easier to it's much easier to create a toll booth to allow people to make money or to capture and sell attention as with the the advertising business model and as as jimmy mentions that usenet is still popular as for anonymized file sharing and that's certainly true it's it, it's definitely kind of found a niche, although it's wildly inefficient for that purpose because it, it replicates things everywhere. But yes, U Usenet certainly does exist. But I think there was a time around 1994, 1995, where Usenet and, and the web were almost kind of on the same level in terms of interest and popularity. And, and that's obviously changed now. U Usenet is, is pretty obscure these days, but, but still used. So what, it, what was the effect of this? Well, in the 25 years since then, what we've seen is an incredible concentration of power with the internet in a handful of companies that we're all familiar with. I call them the, the internet oligopoly. When, when, it, when I can pronounce oligopy, well, that's a hard to pronounce. But these are, these are companies we're all familiar with. Pretty much everything you do on the internet goes through one or more of these companies. I kind of describe it as the, the public square is now privately owned. The internet is very much our modern public square, and it's privately owned by companies that do not have a good record on censorship, for the most part, don't really believe in freedom of speech. And a number of cases, they've censored accurate information, they've censored information in a way that was blatantly politically biased. And now sometimes people say, well, yeah, they censored people, but I really didn't like the people they censored, so that's a good thing. But what I try to remind people of is that they may be censoring your enemies today, but they'll be censoring you to, you and your friends tomorrow. So I think censorship is, is very much, no matter who you are, if you believe that your ideas will win out in a kind of fair level marketplace of ideas, then you should be opposed to censorship. I believe it's it's always counterproductive. The good guys don't censor. The Star Wars, you know, the, the Empire, they censor. The Rebels, they're not into censorship. So I, I really, I, I genuinely think this is has become a, a threat to democracy. There, and I'm certainly not not the only one to recognize that. People are trying to address it. Elon Musk is currently trying to buy Twitter. I'm not exactly sure how that's going, but he clearly recognizes the danger, and certainly that's one solution. I view this as a technical problem. I view this as as an architectural problem. We built, we designed the internet in such a way that it inherently concentrates power. We didn't have to design, well, we didn't have to design it like that, although it, it's it's fairly clear why we designed it like that. It's much easier, but I think it's, it's very important. It, it's very important to provide an alternative to that centralized internet. And that's really the, the, the purpose of Locutus. So at a, at a high level, what does the solution look like? Well, the solution looks a lot like a almost a parallel internet built on top of the same underlying internet communication protocols, specifically internet protocol and UDP. But in instead of the client server model that you see with the web, this provides a decentralized alternative that can do most or all of what you can do with the client server model but do, an, do it in a, a decentralized way. Um, so what is Locutus fundamentally? It's a decentralized, scalable key value store. So you could think of a key value store as, as, as a very simple database. You have a key, you have some data, you put the key, you insert the data under the key, if you subsequently have the key, you can retrieve the data. So it's a, it's almost a file system is also a, a, a key value store. It's truly peer-to-peer. -peer, so 
Everyone using Locutus is also contributing back to the Locutus network. So this is kind of very, very much going back to the kind of peer to peer, to the kind of world of peer to peer as it existed 20 years ago. And this makes sense because consumer hardware has just got so much more powerful. Consumer internet connections, not all of them. But, you know, a lot of us are sitting on the end of gigabit or two multi gigabit Ethernet connections. And so the idea that we're just using this incredible consumer technology purely to just consume information seems, seems like a tremendous waste. So Locutus is true peer to peer in that every participant in the network is essentially both a consumer and contributing back to, to the network. So in this key value store, the values are pretty much arbitrary data. So it's, it's, it's a, a, just a, a chunk of bytes, and that can be whatever you want it to be. We'll talk about some, some of the applications later, but that could just be text, that could be code, that could be video and audio. It could really be anything. But the, and this is kind of really what, what I think sets Locutus apart. The keys in this key value data store are actually code. It's WebAssembly code that represents a contract that specifies what state, what value is permissible under that key, and how can that, how can that value be updated? What are the criteria under which that value can be updated? And it also controls how that value can be synchronized across multiple peers in, in the peer-to-peer -peer network. So just kind of deep diving on that a little bit. So you can think of the cryptographic contract, the key in the key value store, like a like it's kind of protecting the state. It's governing what state is allowed and how the state can be modified. With If you're familiar with databases, you could think of the cryptographic contract like an access control list, an ACL, for the state, except that it's enforced through cryptography it, rather than rather than just kind of a database where it's kind of hardwired. Uh, and then the, the other key thing is that the cryptographic contract, you can have potentially two valid states for a given key that are different, and a contract must provide a way to merge those states. So for people who are familiar with kind of concurrent systems, this whole question of what do you do when state gets out of sync is, is kind of a big issue with, with any system like this. Locutus implements what's called eventual consistency, which means that given enough time, the state will eventually become consistent. And the mechanism through which that occurs is that contracts must provide a way to merge any two valid states. But the mechanism through which the contract does that is extremely flexible. So Locutus really is not prescriptive at all about how contracts do this. Contracts can use their own serialization format. If you want to use JSON, you can use it. If you want to use protocol buffers, you can use it. These contracts, as I said, they're implemented in WebAssembly which for anyone unfamiliar with WebAssembly, it was designed as a replacement for JavaScript. Most current web browsers support WebAssembly and it's, it's essentially a kind of machine code that allows you, it's kind of a write once deploy it everywhere machine code. So like you could take a video game, compile it to WebAssembly and deploy it to a web browser and not quite that simple, but the, the point is it's like JavaScript but pretty much as fast as machine code. And you can compile many different languages to WebAssembly. We're using Rust. That's probably one of the most popular languages to compile to WebAssembly. There's also AssemblyScript, which is kind of like a version of TypeScript or JavaScript that compiles to WebAssembly. But there are many, many other languages. Almost any language that has a compiler can compile to WebAssembly. So whatever tools you're familiar with, you can use with Locutus. And that was kind of one of our important design goals. So this distributed key value store, how does it work? So you've got data that's spread all across this network. You want to find a particular piece of data. How do you do it? If this was a centralized system, it'd be easy. You'd go to a central server. You'd say, hey, this is the data I'm looking for. Where is it? Central server would tell you where to get it or would get it for you and you go get it. But we don't have centralized servers in Locutus. So 
we use a different approach. So you may have heard of small world network, or, or if not that, you may have heard of the, the concept of six degrees of separation or the Kevin Bacon game. And this originates from the 1960s, actually from an experiment done by a social psychologist called Stanley Milgram. And what Milgram did was he got hundreds, I think 200 letters, and he wrote the name and address of someone in Boston, Massachusetts, on each of these letters. And then he went to people all over the country, like Kansas, just kind of random parts of the US, and said, hey, your job is get this letter to this person, but you can only do it by sending it to somebody that you know personally. And they need to send it to someone that they know personally, and so on. And so he spread these letters out, and then he waited. And of the letters that actually arrived after a couple of weeks, he noticed that the average number of people that these letters went through in order to get to this destination was six. And so that's that's where this idea of six degrees of separation comes from. And what it demonstrates is that certain types of networks have this ability where at each point in the network, you can make a decision based upon information that you just know individually. So in this case, just who your friends are, you know, you get this letter, like you don't know the person on it, but you know, it's in Boston, Massachusetts. Maybe you have a cousin in Massachusetts, so you send it to them. And so you're, you're rooting based on local information. And yet, even in a country of over 300 million people, this letter is able to find its way to its destination, is able to find its way to its destination in a very short series of steps. Planoid asks a question, how does small world routing compare to IPFS, Catamelia? Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. It's actually very similar. So Catamelia is, is a distributed hash table, and you could view small world networks as a type of distributed hash table. They're maybe a little bit more heuristic than some other distributed hash tables, but the basic principle of operation is the same where each peer in the network has local information that they can use to make global routing decisions. So small world networks have similar scalability characteristics to other distributed hash tables, such as Catamelia. Yeah, so you can see them as being quite similar. They have a little bit of a, we actually, we developed Freenet and we use this kind of small world idea in Freenet and that kind of predated the, the popularization of the term distributed hash table a little bit. So, so there's kind of a, it's kind of one, an example of kind of parallel evolution of a similar technology, but, but you, can, you can view them as being very similar. So, so the question then is what kind of networks have this small world property? And the answer is not all of them. If you just took a bunch of people and then you randomly chose friends for each of those people to have, gave them a list of their friends, randomly chosen, and then tried this Milgram experiment, it wouldn't work. The, the letters would not be able to find their way to the destination. And the reason is that for a small world network to, to work properly, it needs to have this property where nodes in the network that are close to each other are more likely to be connected to each other than nodes that are distant. So human relationships naturally have this quality. You're a lot more likely to have a relationship with your next door neighbor than you are to have a relationship with a random person on the far side of the planet. And so if you want to build a computer network, a kind of artificial small world network, you need to ensure that it maintains this property where the, the actual mathematical optimal is that the probability of a connection existing between two peers is inversely proportional to the distance between those peers. Now, the, the concept of distance is, is kind of a funny one. With humans, you know, you could look at you could look at geographic distance. We're not dealing with geographic distance when it comes to Locutus. In Locutus, we create effectively a one-dimensional universe, which is a ring 
where the distance between any two peers, peers are assigned positions on this ring, and the distance between any two peers is just how far, what's the quickest way to get to the other peer along this ring. But the, one of the not nice things about small world networks is that it's pretty flexible in terms of what you mean by distance. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but one of the things we'd like to be able to support in the future is mesh networking with Locutus. So that, that's, that's a, this is kind of getting into what do we do if the whole internet goes down? Can we have some kind of backup to the internet? So, but that's, a, that's kind of more pie in the sky stuff, but it, it is a big benefit of small world networks that they're, they're very flexible and they're also very intuitive to work with. And so you can see here the kind of ring and you can see in this kind of simple small world, small, small world network that peers which are close together are all connected, peers which are distant, the connections are, are much more infrequent. And you can see on the graph there that it has this kind of inverse proportionality in the distances. And, and if you, you can take people and you can look at their geographic distance and who they're friends with, and you'll see a very, very similar pattern. So I've got, I've gone into this, but why small world? It's scalable. So small world networks have great scalability characteristics, really logarithmic scalability characteristics, similar to a, a hash map data structure, except of course it's, it's entirely decentralized. They're also very fault tolerant. If multiple peers can fail and they'll just kind of root around those those failed peers. And it's all, it's also distributed. There's no, you don't need any kind of super smart peers to act like direct directory lookups or anything like that. Each peer just has local knowledge and they can root globally based on their local knowledge. So it's distributed and decentralized. And as I said, it's, it's also very flexible. So we can do things like support mesh networking in the future where we don't actually control which peers are connected to which other peers. And then just to, to kind of illustrate the scalability, so this is kind of sublinear scalability. If you're designing an algorithm and you want to make it scalable, this is what you want the graph to look like. So we can scale up to billions of peers without any problem. So go, going back to how, how does Locutus actually work? So Locutus, as a key value store, you can store some data under a key. Other people given the key can retrieve that data, but it goes further. You can also subscribe to a key such that if the, va if the key's state, its value is modified, you're notified immediately when that happens. And so this opens up all kinds of real-time communication. This opens up applications like instant messaging. It opens up things like live streaming of video and audio. What I'm doing right now should be possible over Locutus in a, in a completely distributed and decentralized way. So in, yeah, so, so IPFS definitely has a, has a pub sub mechanism as well. So you, you, Locutus is not unique in having this, having something like a pub sub, but the publish subscribe mechanism is really kind of baked into the way Locutus works versus I think with IPFS, it's something that was kind of more, more added later. And also IPFS is kind of solving quite a, quite a different problem more generally. But so with Locutus, the, the way that it works here, you have a, a bunch of peers. A contract in Locutus has a location and the location is derived from the contract itself. So we actually take a hash, a cryptographic hash of the contract, and that's then converted into a number between zero and one, which represents an actual position on that ring. And so every contract has a position in the network every peer has a position in the network that's assigned when the peer joins the network in, in a way that's designed to make it difficult for peers to choose their own position. And the basic principle with Locutus is that peers that are close to a contract are expected to cash that contract. And so in this diagram, you can see that the 
the location of the contract is at the center of this large green circle and the peers that are close to it, the green peers, they're the, the origin peers, they will actually cash the contract because they recognize that they're close to it. And one of these blue peers wants to subscribe to that contract. So kind of going the, in the opposite direction of the arrows, the blue peer will send a message through these intermediate peers that will route towards the location of the contract that it's interested in. When it hits the green peer that has the contract, the contract will then be retrieved through these peers and it will maintain this subscription through these intermediate peers such that whenever, whenever the contract state is updated, that will be propagated immediately to any peers that are interested in it. And one of the really nice things about this design is let's say you have a contract that is wildly popular that millions of people are interested in. This actually, the peers will self-organize into an efficient content distribution network for that contract. So even despite the fact that it's extremely popular, you're not going to get, I'll date myself here, we used to call this the slash dot effect where a website would suddenly become popular and would go down as a result. That can't happen with Locutus. So it's a self-scaling content distribution network. And of course, it's very robust. So if any of these peers were to fail, the network would just immediately kind of root around that failure to find another way to, to access the data. So what does this actually look like from the perspective of the end user? Well, Locutus is really... Locutus we're trying to build a platform. We're trying to build something that other people can build applications on top of. So I would distinguish that from something like a library where it's kind of something that's bundled as part of an application, but the application is still responsible for kind of getting deployed and, and getting onto the user's computer. So with Locutus, it's more analogous to the web where once you've got the web browser, you can now access, you can access online apps like Gmail or, or Twitter or Facebook or, or whatever it is. And all of that goes through the web browser. With Locutus, we also take advantage of the web browser. So the Locutus software, you download it, install it. It's like, oh, we're hoping it'll be like 20, 30 megabytes, so very, very small. And then you go to it in your web browser, you, you visit your web browser, you visit the Locutus node, which will actually expose a kind of web interface on your computer. And you'll then have a menu of applications. Think of it kind of like an app store that we will initially curate, but unlike the app store, not everything has to be curated by us, but obviously we, we wanna kind of put our best foot forward in terms of the applications that people find first. Um, but these, the applications in Locutus are themselves essentially single page web apps. So these are web applications that you can build using tools that you're already familiar with, like React, Vue.js, whatever the, the latest felt, I think is kind of the, the current framework du jour, but whatever the web, whatever the kind of web framework you're comfortable with, most familiar with, you can build it using that. So you can build it using JavaScript, TypeScript. You can use another language so, such as Rust, which a framework called U where you can com compile your web application to WebAssembly. So it's, it's kind of super efficient in the browser. But whereas a normal web application, you would kind of download it from the web, you download it from the website, and then it would connect back to the, uh, connect back to a REST API or a WebSocket connection. With Locutus, the web app connects to your local peer through a WebSocket and through that peer, it's able to query contracts, it's able to subscribe to contracts, and it's able to update contracts. And so this, this we're replacing what would normally be a kind of REST API with the database behind it. We're replacing that with the Locutus key value store, where you've got this extremely flexible, extremely powerful contract mechanism that can do pretty much anything a database can do, plus it can support real-time notification of updates. So one of the kind of key things that we're trying to do with Locutus is take advantage of existing technologies wherever possible. We're not reinventing the web browser. 
we're using the web browser. We're not reinventing all of these user interface frameworks like React and so on. You can use the ones you're already familiar with. We're just swapping out the centralized component, which is kind of typically the kind of REST interface that's sitting on a web server in a database. So what kind of things will we be able to build on top of Locutus? Well, our goal is, you know, as much as possible because we really want to decentralize everything that can be decentralized. So examples would include decentralized email. This, this may be probably one of the first things we're, we're going to build. The advantage, so the, the concept here is that uh, apparently Telios has decentralized email. There, there, this is not entirely new. So you may be familiar with Proton Mail, which has been around for a while and which is very popular. It's got over 50 million users, but their original pitch was that they would create something kind of like decentralized email where your inbox would not be controlled by evil Google. But what they ended up building was, was really just kind of Gmail, but controlled by a different company. And so I think there is an opportunity to have a truly decentralized email that we can build on top of Locutus. Now, of course, not every, you know, initially there aren't going to be very many people using email on Locutus. So what we'll also do is provide a gateway to conventional email. So, so the notion here is that you'd be able to sign up if you want to kind of use the the kind of gateway to conventional email, you'd sign up, you'd maybe pay a small fee, you would get your chosen username at freenet.org. That would be a normal email address, except that email sent to it would be stored in your decentralized inbox that you and only you control. And if you send emails to other people that are also using Locutus email, that entire thing will be decentralized end to end. So we provide a smooth migration path from existing email to decentralized email. Decentralized microblogging, so this is a social media application, probably one of the most topical things. In our internal experimentation, we kind of, our, our kind of Locutus hello world is something that works like Twitter. And we think that's, that's going to be pretty important. Instant messaging, of course, WhatsApp signal, that kind of use case. That will, that demonstrates that there's nothing to prevent you from sending private information through Locutus. So if I just want, and it's true of email as well, of course, data can be encrypted and stored in the contract state in such a way that only the intended recipient can read it. Reputation systems. So it, one of the things that annoys me about the internet as it's evolved over the years is that it's essentially a series of walled gardens and reputation systems are the perfect example of this. You've got Uber has its own re reputation system. Yelp has its own reputation system. eBay has its own reputation system. They don't talk to each other and really the kind of centralized nature of the internet plus the business models encourage this kind of wall garden approach but with Locutus, everything is really a component and everything is programmatically accessible so we can build a general purpose reputation system that can be used you know for example as a spam prevention mechanism for decentralized email or a trust mechanism for an online store where vendors would establish reputation over time. And all of these can kind of use the same component. So it's really kind of getting back to this more kind of almost a Unix philosophy of simple components that can be assembled together into applications rather than everything just kind of being its own independent wall garden. The, the, the other thing in terms of the reputation, I think that the, the other thing that's kind of interesting here is there was a time with the internet, I, I would guess it's like kind of around 2007, I guess was the peak of it, where everyone was like, oh, everything should have an API. And so Reddit created an API and Facebook created an API and Twitter created an API. And all of these companies created APIs, which was great. It was kind of getting towards this kind of idea of everything is a component and everything is pro programmatically accessible. And then they pretty much all backtracked on that for various different reasons. It was open to abuse or it undermined their existing business model and so on. I think Reddit may be the only 
a, the only large company that kind of kept its API, that they didn't kind of cripple their API over time. But I think Locutus has the potential to, to return to that kind of internet of interoperable, programmatically accessible components versus just all of these kind of walled gardens. And this is this is really kind of drilling down on, on that idea. Yeah, everything's a walled garden. Everything's a component with Locutus. Everything's programmatic by default. Reputation system is, I think, one of the most obvious examples of a reusable component. And Locutus may, so a lot of the reasons why people disable their APIs, such as susceptibility to denial of service attacks, that's really not possible with Locutus just because of the way that that uh, Likudis handles data. Yeah, so Mohammed asked to hear more about the reputation system. So yeah, so, so this is kind of more conceptual at the moment. It's something we've done quite a lot of thinking about, but we haven't started to implement yet. So, so the notion, the idea would be that you would create a reputation which would be represented in Locutus as you would have a, a, a contract and a reputation log would be, the, would be the state of the contract. And this would essentially be a record of your interactions with other people and what their feedback was. So to bootstrap a reputation, we kind of thought about various ways to do it. So sometimes you want to kind of create a cost for something. So one way we may allow people to bootstrap a reputation is by making a donation to Locutus. And the idea behind that is if creating reputations is free, then there's really nothing is at risk with your, your reputation and you can kind of just create reputations and burn them without, without any cost. So if, if you have a way to create a not very significant cost, but some cost to creating a reputation, then that I think increases the value of the system and also provides a way for Qtus to generate revenue that we can use to, to fund development. But then the, the idea is, let's say that you and I want to have some kind of interaction that's a trusted interaction. So what I would do is I would take a reputation token and I would sign it and give it to you and vice versa. And we would then be able, we would have our interaction. And if, if the interaction went well, then we would each be able to use that signed reputation token to add something to the other person's reputation log saying, yeah, we had an interaction, it went well. If the interaction doesn't go well, then we can use that reputation token to add some negative feedback to the other person's reputation. So this is, this is quite similar to the eBay feedback mechanism, except it's occurring in an entirely decentralized way using cryptography versus such a server sitting in a data center. Um, but yeah, there, there's, there's a lot more potential with reputation. You could have different types of reputation because, you know, for example, I might have a decent reputation as a, a software engineer, hopefully, but I may not have a decent reputation as a chef. So there, it can get pretty sophisticated and also I think get very interesting because now, because you can have multiple applications that are using the same reputation system as a component, I think it, it, it just gets a lot more valuable. So you can use your reputation established maybe on a discussion system for maybe you've got an online store or something like that. So as you allow people to kind of mix and match components and use them together with each other, I think you get exponential value out of those components. So what are, what are we build, What are we using to build it? So Locutus is built in Rust. For those of you who are not familiar with Rust, it's a language that really appeared in the last half decade or so. It was developed by Mozilla. I think of it really as a replacement for C++. I think that's kind of what it's trying to do. It's really good if you need to write code that's kind of close to the metal, but it's also got very, very powerful abstractions, particularly when it comes to things like preventing race conditions and, and a lot of these concurrency issues that can come up a lot with peer-to-peer -peer applications in particular because they're so as asynchronous. And yeah, I think Rust is it's a very popular programming language. I think it, it's voted the most popular programming language in bull kind of competitions over, over the past couple of years. So it's very, very popular. Contracts, as I mentioned before, implemented in WebAssembly. You can, that means you can use Rust. And of course we, we use Rust because it's easier to kind of use the same language across the board. 
but many other languages can compile to WebAssembly, including kind of JavaScript-like languages, if, if that's what you're familiar with. And then, as, as I said, the, the user interface is all through a web browser, so, so you get to reuse all of the kind of web app user interface tooling that, that we're all already familiar with. So, so far, Locutus, the reception, just looking at our kind of GitHub stars, this graph is slightly out of date, but you know, we hit about, we hit about a thousand GitHub stars in two months. The reception has been very positive front page of hacker news. I've posted to various different subreddits a couple of times, and it always seems to find its way to the front page. So I think there's a clear appetite for something like Locutus. I'm not, not the only person who, who sees the value of it and. Uh, in terms of current status, we started implementing June of last year, so just over a year ago. I recruited two developers who've really been working on it since then with, with me. The Protocol Labs, which is the company behind IPFS and Filecoin, were kind enough to give us a grant, which we've been using to fund development. We expect, we expect a prototype release in August 22, 2022. Where we are right now, we've just about got to the point where we're implementing test applications on top of Locutus and we're able to test them locally. The next major step is to complete all of the peer-to-peer -peer stuff so that we're able to deploy and use applications across kind of a, an actual peer-to-peer -peer network. But the nice thing is we're very, very close to people being able to pick up React or pick up their their development tools and start building applications now such that when we're uh, ready to go live and have an actual distributed decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, people will, will be good to go on that. So lastly, before we get into, into questions, how to help, you can visit our GitHub repo, star it, check out our code, give us feedback, submit pull requests, et cetera, et cetera. If you'd like to support the project financially, you can make a donation at freenetproject.org. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, so you can claim that back on your taxes. If you're interested in making an investment, we also have a commercial company that's, so get in touch with me. We can talk about that. You can follow us on Twitter. And we're also on Matrix. If, if you'd like to talk to me or, or the team, just Jimmy asked a question. Is there more detail about contracts on the GitHub? Yes. If, if you look at the GitHub repo and we're, we're kind of writing code first and then documenting it, which kind of works well where we are. But if you look in the GitHub issues, specifically search for contract, you'll see information about specific to contracts and also perhaps better still join the matrix chat and ask there. And, and if I see you or somebody else sees you, we'll, we'll point you in the right direction. So with that, we've just got a few minutes left, but I'd like to open it up to questions. Good, the good way. How can you expect real-time low latency video streaming between many subscribers, which have a very distance of relayed nodes to reach? So it depends on your definition of low latency. We kind of think of low latency as being kind of a couple of seconds in terms of video streaming. So that would, and, and it can, can be faster than that. So that, that's kind of more, you're doing a live broadcast that would probably be a bit too slow for kind of one-to-one -one video chat, but I think a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection would, would make more sense in that case anyway. But if you're doing something akin to a live broadcast on YouTube, the way we're designing the system is, is that the latency between publishing a packet of video and consumers receiving it will be on the order of a couple of seconds, which is acceptable for something akin to a, a, a live broadcast. The way we're, we're designing pretty much every part of the system is to make it hyper-efficient. So contracts are implemented WebAssembly, very low level language. It's really just kind of dealing with raw bits and bytes. And so we're working hard to make everything as efficient as it can be, but of course, going over peer-to-peer -peer network is not going to be as fast as if my computer is sending IP packets directly to your computer. But in that case, you could negotiate the connection over Locutus and then your computers would just establish a direct connection. Of course, then you would you would know the other party's IP address, but that's just par for the course. Nick asked a question. There's been a lot of interest in the Discord matrix about building proof concept applications. You mentioned wanting to loop in application developers before a public release. For these people who want to contribute by building applications on top of Locutus and fill out the proof of concept library, 
what should these people be doing right now? That's a that's a really great question. I would say right now, follow us, follow us on Twitter, join our matrix chat. If if people have suggestions for better ways, like to kind of be kept informed, I, I really think we're we're probably like a week or two away from having something akin to an actual SDK. It'll be simple, it'll be pr- it'll be low level, but an actual SDK where people can start building stuff. We're very very close to it, but not quite there yet. So, uh, but we will announce everything to Twitter. So that's what I'd recommend. And if people have suggestions for better ways that we can kind of keep them informed. Oh, also subscribe to the Freenet subreddit if for for Reddit users we we announce everything there as well. And I'll try to announce significant stuff on other relevant subreddits like the privacy subreddit, like the cryptocurrency subreddit and so on. How does it compare to Matrix in terms of rooting? Not super familiar with the architecture of Matrix, but my understanding is that it's a federated it's it's kind of a federated approach similar to similar to the way email works. So you, you've, it's kind of more decentralized in that there's not just kind of one server, but instead there are a lot of different servers which communicate with each other over the internet using the DNS for lookup. So I, I kind of view federated systems like matrix, like email is also federated as like kind of almost a halfway point between true peer-to-peer like Locutus and and centralized approaches. I do believe that Matrix are at least thinking about kind of peer-to-peer approach, but it's not clear how much progress they've they've made towards that. We'd certainly like to work with them. I think Locutus would be a great way for them to achieve that. And I'd love to talk to them about that. Yeah, their their dev says Matrix has scalability issues. I, th- I think with with a federated approach, the problem is it's yeah you've you've got multiple servers, but if your one server becomes wildly popular, then you've got all of the same problems of a centralized system. So it's, so it's essentially essentially what you've got is that you've got a federation of centralized systems, and so that limits scalability. Well, I think with that, I will wrap it up and yeah, looking forward to hoping to kind of build a community around this. So, so thank you very much to you all.